Hello, my name is Hope Williard. I'm a scholar who studies late antiquity, and this video is an introduction to the histories of Gregory of Tours. Over the next 15 or so minutes, I'm going to try to answer five questions. First of all, who was Gregory of Tours? Second of all, what are the histories? Third of all, when did Gregory write the histories? Fourth, why did he write the histories? And fifth, what should I look out for when I'm reading the histories? Gregory lived during the 6th century in what had been the Roman provinces of Gaul. From the 5th century onwards, these provinces had been ruled by a barbarian people called the Franks, named after their legendary founder, Merovich. They ruled what we now call the Merovingian kingdoms. Gregory himself was of Roman ancestry. He was born on St. Andrew's Day in around 538 and died in office as Bishop of Tours in 594. Gregory could trace his family tree all the way back to the second century, and he was very proud of the fact that he came from a family which had served in ecclesiastical office for centuries. He was the 19th Bishop of Tours, and he was very proud that out of those bishops, 14 of them had been his relative. As a child, Gregory was sent to the household of his mother's brother Gallus, the Bishop of Clermont, and up until the time he was ordained himself at about the age of 25, Gregory was raised by relatives in ecclesiastical households. Gregory became the Bishop of Tours in 573, and he held that office until his death in 594. Over the 21 years he was bishop, one of the things he saw was his city shifting between Merovingian kingdoms as the boundaries between the three major kingdoms, Austrasia, Neustria, and Burgundy, shifted. Gregory lived through multiple civil wars, and he participated in and bore witness to church councils, deaths, dinners, epidemics, education, famines, festivals, and the grottings and the good times of the 6th century. The histories are Gregory's major work, and one of the most famous works of history written in the early Middle Ages. They're comprised of ten books. You might also see them called the History of the Franks, or the Ten Books of the Histories. It's important to note that Gregory was a prolific author, and in addition to writing a ten-book narrative history, he also wrote eight volumes about the lives and deeds of the saints, as well as a commentary on the Psalms and a book about the offices of the church. The histories are special not just because they're very long, ten books, and also complete, but also because of the fact that there had been nothing like them written in Gaul for over 150 years. Gregory of Tours was the first person to take up his pen to write a narrative history of his past and his times since the early 5th century. Now, Gregory was writing in a tradition of narrative histories, both a Latin classical tradition and a Christian tradition of writing history of the world from its beginning. But what he's doing also hasn't been done where he's doing it for a long time. The ten books of the histories begin with the creation of the world according to the Christian tradition and they end in the Merovingian kingdoms in the year 591. And as the books go on, the pace of the narrative gets more and more rapid. And you can see this really clearly when you look at the fact that book one covers nearly 6,000 years, books five through 10 cover 16. 
addition to thinking about who Gregory was and what the histories are, we also should think a little bit about when, during his lifetime, Gregory wrote the histories. And this is a question about which scholars have not really yet come to a consensus, and probably never will. Most scholars agree that Gregory began to write down the events of the past and the events of his own day after 573, so after he had become the Bishop of Tours. A key point of debate about the writing of the histories is whether Gregory composed them at the time events happened or if he wrote about events after the fact. It's previously been assumed that Gregory was a naive or superstitious chronicler just writing stuff down as it happened. So kind of a diarist of the Merovingian kingdoms without a lot of control over his material. What scholars have over the past 20 to 30 years really come to appreciate about Gregory's work is that he's actually very careful about how he designs things and what he says. So the general consensus tends to be that Gregory did a bit of both. He both reacted to events as they happened and he also looked back on events and reflected on them and revisited things again. The key thing for you to know approaching this text for the first time is that it's complicated and that many parts of it are carefully designed. And one of the aspects we can begin to explore, taking the premise that Gregory designed the histories very carefully, is some of the reasons why he might have chosen to write this particular text in this particular format at this particular time containing the particular events that he chooses to put in there. There are a lot of publications that have been written about why Gregory is doing what he does. And this is doubtless something you'll we'll dive into more in your class discussions and assignments, but there are two main purposes it's good to start off thinking about. The first is that Gregory is writing from a moralistic perspective. As a Christian bishop, he sees good in the world, he sees evil in the world, and he wants to draw a real contrast between those two things, the saved and the damned, the wicked and the righteous. The second thing is that like any historian, Gregory's aim is to record and interpret what's going on in the world around him, and one of the things we can say is that because his focus is so much on a very compressed period of about 16 years, he is interested in leaving a record and an interpretation for people who come after him. Gregory talks about what he's doing with the histories at a number of different times. Each of the ten books has a preface. The preface to book five is one of the parts of the text that historians have particularly focused on and written about, because this is the part where Gregory really kind of lets rip with his feelings about the Merovingian Civil War. And he says, It gives me no pleasure to write of all the different civil wars which afflicted the Frankish people and their rulers. How many times has Rome, the city of cities, the great head of all the world, been brought low by her civil dissensions? Yet it is true that, when the strife was over, she rose once more as if out of the ground. Gregory is focused on narrating the events of his 
of his own day, but he also wants people, both his contemporaries and future readers, to learn from those events and to not make some of the mistakes that he sees his contemporaries making. One of the fascinating things about the histories is that there are various points in the text where Gregory reflects on the process of writing. He talks about his own writing style. I know very well that my style in the books is lacking in polish. This is one of a couple of different places where he worries that his Latin isn't very good and people who read the histories are going to look down on them because they're written in this language that isn't always correct. But at the same time, he's very fierce about the fact that he sees what he's done as a unit and he has very definite intentions about them. Nevertheless, I conjure you all, never permit these books to be destroyed or to be rewritten or to be reproduced in part only with sections omitted. Keep them in your possession intact with no amendments and just as I have left them to you. So while historians still debate and research and make new discoveries about what Gregory may have intended to do with the ten books of the histories, the fact that he saw them as a coherent whole is something that's worth paying attention to when you read and when you think about what he might be up to. As a whole is something that's interesting to think about and to pay attention to as you read. I'd like to conclude this video by suggesting three things to think about as you read the history. The first thing is the fact that Gregory tells his stories in a series of episodes. It's what scholars of the history sometimes talk about as episodic narration. You get these little kind of capsules of stories in the history. But there's one further thing that you need to notice about the episode. And that's that they're very often connected. So when you're reading an excerpt from the histories and you notice that Gregory's used someone's name once, it is always worth going through the text a bit more and looking for what he says about that person in other places, because you can sometimes build a really interesting picture by doing it. The second theme that struck me over the years I've read the histories is the role of women in Gregory's narrative. The Merovingian kingdoms had a number of very powerful female personalities, queens and saints, and Gregory pays attention to them in his narrative in a way that I think you'll enjoy paying attention to as you read this text for the first time. And the third theme that I think is interesting to focus on as you read the histories is one that struck me when I was reading the histories for the first time as an undergraduate student, and that's the theme of humor. The fact that Gregory sometimes does seem to be telling things in a sort of wry way where he's perhaps intending to make his reader laugh a little as well as make them think. I hope this video has given you a helpful introduction and overview to who Gregory of Tor was, what he wrote, when he wrote it, and some of the reasons why he may have written what he did. Thank you very much for listening, and enjoy the histories of Gregory of Tor.